Witam Państwa serdecznie, Błażej Hrabkowicz, 31. edycja festiwalu Energa Camera Image w Toruniu and our guest is cinematographer Rodrigo Prieto. That's right. Did I say it correctly? Yes, very well. <laughs> we, we, there was a little lesson before. Yes, let's, we rehearsed. <laughs> yes, let's be honest, we rehearsed that. How are you? Everything okay? Yes, great. Happy to be here. Yeah, enjoying Torun, the festival? Yes, well, we just arrived, but uh, just walking over here was wonderful. I really think the town is beautiful. Yeah. And last time I was here, it was already beautiful, but there were still things in construction, but now, now it's really nice. Yeah. yeah. Before we talk about Killers of the Flower Moon, because this is a film in a competition you're here with, a Martin Scorsese picture, uh, I want to talk to you about Barbie <laughs> by Greta Gerwig, not only because the film is huge, but, uh, but um, in terms of success, commercial success also, but mainly uh, from the artistic standpoint, because the world created in that film, the universe created in that film by, by Greta Gerwig and yourself, in visual terms is really uh, striking and really original. So I want to ask you about the process of uh, working on that world from a visual terms. What were your uh, main goals, main challenges, main tasks, and what did you talk about with Greta Gerwig in the process of creating that world? Well, uh, in fact, I was in Oklahoma preparing Killers of the Lara Moon when I got a, the call from Greta about a movie she was going to do, and then she said it was Barbie. So that was startling. <laughs> but I knew that uh, with her doing it, it was going to be something special. And uh, so I was very excited about it and very different, obviously, from what I was doing right there in Oklahoma. Sure. Uh, so that was exciting. And we started right, right away talking about ideas of how to, for example, uh, photograph Barbie Land versus the real world and how, how would they be different and Greta already had a series of, of uh, references and images and ideas. Uh, Sarah Greenwood, the production designer, also was in some of these zooms that we were doing on weekends. Uh, finally, I had to ask Greta, please, now I need to concentrate on Killers of the Flower Moon because this is a very complicated movie and when I'm finished, we'll get back to Barbie and that's, that's, what, we, that's what we did. But even from beforehand, um, we started talking about how to, you know, um, photograph pink, for example, what shades of pink to do, how artificial to make the Barbie land or how realistic. And Greta already had this uh, term, um, uh, artificial authenticity uh, or authentic artificiality, <laughs> either yeah, way. Interesting, yeah. So the, the notion was to create a world that felt fake because it's a toy world, but she didn't want it to look like they're miniatures exactly, but they do live in, you know, in Barbie land where the house is, you know, the Barbie's dream house and all these things. So uh, we started creating a series of rules. And uh, one of the things that Greta mentioned is that she wanted to feel like when you, as a child, you open a box and the way a toy is presented to you. And at Barbie's, you know, you open the Barbie and she's right there with her combs and stuff. And it's yeah. all very frontal. Yeah. It's very clean and innocent. And so that became kind of the... Uh, idea behind the way the camera behaves is uh, most shots would be frontal like like that. You know, we see something, it's not going to be on an oblique angle. It's going to be like you open the box, it's frontal mm -hmm. or sideways or behind or in front. You know, so if you remember in the movie, anytime we're tracking with a vehicle, we're completely sideways with it or or right in front or right behind. So these were uh, ideas of how the camera would behave. It's also mechanical. The, the, the camera tracks on a very perfect, you know, side angle or forward. You know, everything's perfect because in Barbie Land, everything, you know... It's supposed it's, to be perfect. It's supposed to be perfect. So, yeah. except when things malfunction. But then the camera doesn't know that Barbie's going through an existential crisis. So she, for example, when she comes down from the house and it's like a kid that brings her, puts her in the car, that's why she floats down. Um, the camera is ready to do the same shot, come, come out and, you know, widen out as she comes down perfectly to the car. But she falls out of frame because the camera isn't ready for imperfection, you see. So this notion became a joke, you know. So um, also the lighting, uh, we use, we, you know, we saw many references, but the umbrellas of Sherbug was a big reference with Catherine Deneuve. The lighting is very uh, frontal and uh, the separation is done with color. So that became another reference for us and that was a challenge for me you know to a, a world full of light how to make that powerful visually you know and and figure out the color of it and anyway it was uh, a lot of design went into it and thought and testing and things like that but it was a 
very exciting to create this this feeling of, a, of this uh, artificial world, but still give it a, a feeling that you could be there, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes. Artificial authenticity, exactly. uh, the term by Greta Garwick. It's interesting because I guess you can sort of apply it to cinema yes. as a whole. Because yes. it is artificial, it is created, but has to have some kind of real feeling yeah. to it for us to engage. Yeah? Yes, I mean, certainly Killers of the Flower Moon, uh, it's a representation of that era of that time of those people, but it is a representation. And that was that became part of the idea also behind uh, for example, the color that we used for different sections of the movie. Killers of the Flower Moon. Killers of the Flower Moon. <laughs> Very different, obviously. But uh, we, I think Scorsese is aware that uh, it is um, us telling the story. It's, it's as, trying to be as uh, honest, let's say, as possible to what happened, but it is still not the reality. It's not a documentary, or even a documentary is also an interpretation. So. Uh, in that sense, we begin the movie with newsreel footage, you know, a black and white, and it's a hand-cranked camera that it's actually a 1917 Bell and Howell camera with black and white negative in it. Um, Scorsese owns that camera, so we use that. So that's a representation of, of the Osage, right? And, and we're doing the same. So uh, I decided to look for uh, a, a color that would emulate the way color photography was at the time, still photography. Mm -hmm. And so we, we picked um, autochrome, which was invented by the Lumiere brothers at the turn of the century. So uh, it's a very specific color. We studied it deeply and we created a lookup table to emulate that for the, let's say, the white people, the descendants of the Europeans. Whereas the Osage, we photographed with natural colors, hmm. all on, on film negative. And, uh, and then towards the end, there's uh, another look, which is based on Technicolor, three-strip Technicolor, uh, very colorful. So again, at the end of the film, there's a radio show that's also in a theater, and they're talking about the story of the Osage and the murders of the, mm -hmm. of the time. It's a, it's a representation, that, that theater show, just as we're doing one. So anyway, it's, 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 um, it's a, as authentic as possible, but it is fake, and we're acknowledging that, same as in Barbie. And by the way, another link between the two is that that lookup table that I used for the end of the movie, that uh, three-strip technical yeah. at the end of Killers of the Lower Moon, I used that as a basis to create the lookup table for Barbie Land, which is different because we adapted it for the color specific of all the pinks and greens and cyans of Barbie, and we called it Techno Barbie. <laughs> because it was based on Technicolor. So anyway, there is a strangely a link between the two movies visually. Mm -hmm. Martin Scorsese is a director, uh, because you've worked with him a couple of times now, not yeah. on The Killer of the Flower Moon, Wolf of Wall Street, among uh, Silence, yes. among the others. Irishman. Yeah, yeah. But um, is he a director that uh, has a frame, composition of the frame in his mind? Is he a director where he really knows what he wants from the scene in terms of blocking the scene, in terms of visually composing the scene, and you just, it, not there all, of course, only to execute it, but, but to offer your, your input and details, or do you work it out as you go? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, it varies, but wh what does happen is that he spends maybe a week or two on his own, uh, nobody can bother him at that time, doing the shot list. So we're doing other things, scouting and, you know, preparing different things. But but he is in a hotel room by his own with a script, with a script. Yeah. And he, he does the whole script shot by shot. And he writes down on the script his ideas of the shots and sometimes little diagrams. And then he'll explain it to the assistant director and myself. We spend a week, mm -hmm. more or less, going through the whole script, and he describes. He tries to. He translates because sometimes it's hard to read. You know, so it's his, his little version of a storyboard. Yes, in some in a way. Yes, and yeah. sometimes he will. He'll actually do some drawings as well. Yeah, yeah. But that's. Uh, it becomes a bible, but it's loose. You know, he's always willing to um, improvise also, and especially if the actors come up with something, an idea that they want to try. He is always open to that. So you have to be ready with a plan to execute the, the, his ideas of the shots, which, by the way, um, are descriptions, but he's never very, very technical about it. You know, so the actual focal length and the camera position, I propose, you know, but it's, it's based on his idea. That, uh, uh, and for him, it's very important 
the energy of the shots, you know, what should a shot feel like? Does the camera move fast or does it not move at all? Does it move sideways or does it just pan? All these are things that are very important to him. Um, but he doesn't specify the, you know, focal length, for example, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, uh, for example, on Killers of the Flower Moon, I remember this moment was very, very striking to me. We were preparing the shot on his shot list. There's a moment where there's this huge explosion, you know, uh, very important characters die and it's a very dramatic moment. And the character that Leonardo DiCaprio plays, he comes back to his house where his wife is waiting with the kids and uh, the nannies and uh, all these people are waiting in the house uh, to get the news. And he comes back and the shot was a point of view coming into the house and they were going to be there in the living room and he delivers the news. So when we're preparing the shot and I lit the living room and I was ready for that, um, then Scorsese asks Lily Gladstone, the actress, where, where do you think you would be? And she said, well, there was an explosion. I would, I would look for a basement. And suddenly it's, oh, is there a basement in this house? And locations, find a basement. And, you know, and they found that there was a door that led to a basement in this house. And mm. so now that's the shot. Now the camera goes into the place, into the kitchen, open a door that, by the way, the door opened the wrong way. We had to change everything. And then, you know, and then she's down there with the family. So it's much more complicated. Uh, so you had to adapt. I had to adapt. So that's one thing that, and I think it's one of the most powerful moments in the movie because of that. You know, there is the shot coming into the house. It's empty now instead of the family being there. And you hear a baby crying and that's real. That's From a sound somewhere. Yes. And that's a real sound of the moment when we're shooting and the camera goes, 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 goes into the kitchen and then the door opens and then you find them in one shot and, and you see her reaction. Very powerful. Mm -hmm. And it's because of him being uh, open to these things that happen mm -hmm. in the instant and we all adapt to it. So he's open uh, not only to your input as a cinematographer, but he's also open to the input of the actors in terms of <laughs> characters. Yes. I guess coming from this idea that uh, at, at a certain point, the person who knows the character best is yeah. the actor playing them. Yes, yes, that's right. I mean, in lots of his movies, the most memorable moments or some of the most memorable moments come from that. And I know that, uh, you know, that uh, at least from movies I've been in, uh, for example, on Wolf of Wall Street, the infamous moment of, uh -huh, uh -huh, am I hitting the microphone? Uh -huh, Matthew uh -huh. McConaughey, yeah. <laughs> yes, that was, that happened there. That wasn't written or anything. It was an improvisation that that's the way Matthew McConaughey prepares his voice. And DiCaprio was the one who said, hey, Marty, we should incorporate this. It's very funny. And that became, you know, a huge thing in the whole film. Um, yeah. It went viral. It went viral. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's the same thing with the, uh, are you talking to me? You know, there's so many things yeah, yeah. in Scorsese's movies that, that happen like that. And, and, and it, to me, it's, it's uh, important to be ready for anything like that, you know, and, and have a pl lighting plan ready, but be able to yeah. adjust. In terms of actors, I read so uh, somewhere that Martin Scorsese once said about Leonardo DiCaprio that he's a great film actor because when you do a close up, it's all in his eyes. Mm. And you can, you, you as an audience also, we can read into these eyes, we can project onto these eyes yes. uh, uh, something that we feel because we see that is uh, something going on. From uh, 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 that there is a lot of things going on behind these eyes. Yes. From your perspective, uh, uh, is it uh, as a cinematographer, uh, what is the quality of the actors like Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro when you actually film them? Mm. Lily Gladstone also, yes. great actress here. Amazing, she's incredible. Uh, there is. A different, certainly different styles of, of, of acting. So, some actors try to make everything disappear in terms of there's no camera, you know, really try to um, uh, be the person that they're portraying and try to forget everything else. Other actors that, uh, like DiCaprio, are aware of the filmmaking process and, and use that. So precisely, he knows where the camera is, what size uh, it is, what camera movement, then he'll incorporate his performance to become this dance with a camera. Um, Tony Leung was like that. I mean, they're, they're, you know, Matt Damon, many actors that, that, that are like that, 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 you know, project uh, or dance with a camera. Mm -hmm. Lily also, Lily is um, uh, her, her gravitas 
was amazing and and I didn't know that her character was going to be like that you know I didn't necessarily read that way um, but uh, she brought something so powerful to the character and she also brought many um, changes to the dialogue uh, not many but but for example lots of the lines that are now in Osage she asked Scorsese on the day as we were shooting can I say this in Osage and you know the, the movie has much more Osage language than the script uh, and Leo also learned Osage and he said some lines like that and uh, and and then even Bob De Niro he said some lines in Osage everybody wanted to speak Osage <laughs> and uh, and it, it's it's it works because it is true that's the way it was at that moment you know the the people were in Osage country and and would speak the language and that's the irony of this story I mean these horrible things that these people were willing to do and yet they lived among the Osage and they were friends and all that and they even the character of Ernest uh, Leo plays he he falls in love with his wife and yet he's willing to murder her and her family you know it's that sick perspective is uh, something that of course is, is brilliant exploring and, and I think well, very few directors would be able to capture that nuance is very, very that tricky. psychological paradoxes that uh, actually say that uh, we can he falls in he falls in love with her, but he's still willing to do harm with her. And yes. how, why why this evil uh, why does this evil arise in him? This is something that is uh, psychologically very complex, and we see that yes. uh, in the film. Thank you, Rodrigo, for my talking pleasure. to us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.